All right, sorry about that, everyone. Welcome again. Um, we'll have your microphones muted this evening during the program. So if you could please um, mute your microphone if it's not already muted, that would be helpful. Tom will take questions after his talk and you may ask questions by typing them in the chat box during the presentation if they occur to you then, or you may wait until after his formal presentation and then either hit the raise hand button or just wave your hand like this and we will unmute you and you can speak directly with Tom. Um, it's great to have you here, Tom. Tom's a friend of mine um, and he's here to tell us um, tonight about the fascinating life and career of Esther Zimmer Lederberg. Tom is a graduate of Harvard and he earned his PhD in microbiology and immunology at the University of Illinois in Chicago. After working in research and development in the biotech industry, he pursued a career in teaching chemistry at our own um, Housatonic Valley Regional High School just down the road. After his retirement, he spent several years researching this fascinating story. Um, and uh, it has some personal connections, which I think he will share with you. Um, he shares not just a lifelong interest in science with Esther, but also a love of early music, which is very interesting. So Tom, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and uh, take it away. Um, do you see it? <laughs> no. Not yet, nope. Share screen, there we go. There you go. You see that? Yes, and just click slideshow. Oh, that's right. Okay. Uh, slideshow. So. And, sorry, if you click play from start, sorry, Tom, then it'll fill the whole screen. Slideshow, play from start over on the left. There you go. Okay. Um, yeah, this was an obsession for eight years of mine, uh, about eight and a half years. Um, a famous biographer once said that only obsession can explain what keeps the literary biographer going. And uh, that, that was true for me. I, I'm not really sure why I was so obsessed, but I can tell you uh, at the beginning, I heard this story of how uh, Esther invented this, uh, this technique called replica plating. And when I heard this story, I'm gonna... Oops. All right, never mind. I'm not gonna do that. All right, there we are, we're back, we're back here. I'm not gonna do that. But anyway, I heard this story. I was taking a class, an online class about the beginnings of molecular biology. And I heard a story about um, a female uh, scientist who one day she was looking at her at a uh, Petri dish of bacteria cultures. And she was wanting to transfer those colonies, those specks of bacteria from one petri dish to another. And this was an ongoing problem where if you did it one by one, it was really tedious. And she was had been thinking of a way to do it all in one step. So she reaches into her purse and pulls out her compact um, makeup case, you know, the little compact that, that women used to have in their purses and maybe still do. And she took her makeup sponge and stamped it on right on the top of the petri dish and then took it over and put it onto a fresh one sort of like an ink stamp and when i heard that story i just was so i don't know, just so amazed that somebody would do that and she i thought she must have been this creative genius that i stopped uh, i stopped taking the class and i just set out to to learn as much as i could about this fascinating woman she uh, 
she grew up during the depression in the Bronx. Um, her parents were uh, first generation Jewish immigrants who had just moved up from the Lower East Side to uh, the Bronx, a lot of, along with a lot of other people at that time. And she attended uh, public schools and then she went to Hunter College. And uh, when she was only 23, she met Joshua Letterberg, this 21 year old phenom, but they were, they were both phenoms, uh, probably the youngest uh, um, uh, my, microbiologists at this big international meeting at Cold, Cold Spring Harbor in the summer of 1946 and they fell in love and they got married a few months later and they began this 12 year collaboration. Um, for 12 years, they, they worked together closely at the University of Wisconsin. Joshua was at that time, one of the youngest ever assistant professors uh, at age 22 and Esther was a, a graduate student. And what they discovered was, were some of these peculiar features of bacterial sex, um, which, which sounds odd for those of you who know bacteria because bacteria don't have sexual reproduction. It's asexual, the cells just uh, divide in half and they make clones of each other. But what the Letterbergs discovered was that there were these, there was this other process where bacteria could spread their genes to other bacteria. And one of the, the ways that they did this was by this F factor, uh, which actually was this, this gene that when one, one cell gave it to another one, it turned the, the other one into a fertile um, bacteria that then could uh, share its genes. And then uh, another discovery that Esther made was of the Lambda virus, which uh, became the premier model for, for early molecular biology and some of the first uh, techniques for the biotechnology revolution were developed using this virus. One of the, the most important implications of the, the Letterberg's discovery of bacterial sex was, uh, had to do with infectious drug resistance. The, uh, the Japanese, um, after World War II, uh, studying uh, dysentery in, in Japan, discovered that the, uh, the um, Shigella, the, 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 uh, the, the bacteria that causes um, dysentery became um, all of a sudden resistant to three different um, antibiotics. And it reminded them of the work that uh, the Letterbergs had been doing in their laboratory and uh, gradually, but only very gradually, the, the rest of the scientists in the West picked up on this because at the time in 1967, um, there was still this tremendous optimism that antibiotics was going to overcome all infectious disease. And we were gonna you know, enter this new, uh, new world where diseases could be solved by the, the, the every next new uh, antibiotic. Uh, and, we, and we realized too late, you know, recently that that's not the case. So for 12 years, they, the Letterbergs collaborated and it ended up with uh, Joshua Letterberg being awarded the Nobel prize along with uh, um, Edward Tatum and George Beadle, the other two recipients that year. And both of those men had been mentors to Esther Lederberg. So there was this, not only this connection with her husband, but with also two of her former teachers who won the Nobel prize that year. The team of Beadle and Tatum um, won the Nobel prize, but the team of Lederberg and Lederberg only, uh, only Joshua Letterberg was, was awarded and Esther's contributions were ignored. 
So for the uh, award ceremonies, Esther was demoted from co-collaborator to Nobel wife. And this photograph shows you just how young they were. Joshua Lederberg at age 33 was the second youngest recipient of the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine ever. Um, and, and Esther too was at that point pretty young. And there, <laughs> there they are, Esther at the far right uh, with three other women. Um, trying to, you know, she's trying to live up to the role of Nobel wife, but uh, even though the, the following year they moved to, uh, Lederberg's moved to Stanford University where Joshua became the chairman of the new genetics department. And he bought Esther more hats and gloves and insisted that she attend faculty teas and serve on committees with other faculty wives, but she did not fit in. And then a few years later, after they moved to Stanford, the Lederberg separated, uh, divorced in 1967, and Joshua married a much younger divorcee who uh, bore him a daughter, Anne, in 1974. And the divorce was a, tr a traumatic divorce for Esther. She was effectively exiled. Uh, I'm sorry, it says exited, but it should say exiled <laughs> from the elite research community. Um, and for the last decade of her career, she, well, well, she didn't get a, Stanford would not give her a tenure track position uh, faculty position. She uh, didn't have her own laboratory space. She wasn't able to get grants. She was really, her, her career was really uh, truncated. Um, and then they, some of her colleagues had put together this, this special position where she was the curator of the Plasmid Reference Center at Stanford University, which she, um, a role which she had until her retirement in 1985. Along this, around this time uh, in the 1960s, Esther and some other like-minded um, amateurs formed the Mid-Peninsula Recorder Orchestra. Um, at this time in the 60s, there was a renaissance in interest in uh, uh, early music, especially historically performed music. And so she and her fellow amateurs were, uh, who were playing recorders were using recorders that uh, had been modeled after, um, you know, Renaissance recorders. And, uh, and they were, there were scientists, engineers, artists, flower children, uh, a lot of interest in, the, in this early music uh, movement. And Esther performed, you know, she, she had been exiled from the research community in science and her research career was, um, was effectively ended. Uh, so she formed a whole new social group among musicians. And many of them were amateur musicians and she performed with them with the MPRO for 45 years, uh, right up until her death in 2006. And then the best part of this last chapter her, in her life was that she fell in love again with um, a man who shared her passion for music and arts. His name was Matthew Simon. He's a mathematical linguist. And they married in 1993 when Esther was uh, 69, I guess. And uh, the last years of her life were, were spent uh, in, uh, you know, with the new soulmate, soulmate. Um, and I just think that's such an interesting ending. Um, uh, parenthetically, in my own life, in the last uh, 20 years, I've been concentrating more and more on singing early music with crescendo chorus and early music orchestra here in, in Lakeville. And so I, I can really identify with, with her passion for this music and, and the, above all, the uh, ecstatic 
experience that you have when you, you do a live performance. And I think that really saved her and uh, enabled her to uh, um, live out the rest of her life in a, in a really interesting way. Okay. Stop share. Am I back? You're back. Okay. So, um, are you ready for questions, Tom? I am, yeah. All right, well, I'll, I'll start with one. I'm wondering um, what you found out from her um, husband, perhaps, about how she felt about the way um, her career was sidelined and the way she was treated. Did she take it, um, you know, quietly or did she fight for uh, what she yeah, was there's her not Yeah, there's not a lot. I, I know that she, uh, um, well, she didn't win the Nobel Prize, but her husband, Joshua, like most Nobel laureates became very famous. And well, he, and, and a few years later, he started writing a column for uh, the Washington Post where he uh, expounded on all kinds of things from contraception to uh, looking for life in, uh, um, on Mars, uh, exobiology. And uh, she, she, Esther was quoted as, uh, you know, disapproving of that and disapproving of uh, these Nobel laureates who uh, expounded on all kinds of things. She was uh, uh, sort of a hard-headed, no-nonsense woman who, uh, you know, was very, uh, her, her um, commitment to science was, uh, you know, a, a, a commitment that demanded facts and evidence and uh, she wasn't uh, at all impressed with the, the hoopla uh, associated with the Nobel Prize. You know, it's, she said it's decided by a committee and, and I don't think she said it, but it's uh, uh, implying that it's this committee of men. Uh, <laughs> and um, so I don't know, there's a few letters, you know, which describes her, uh, her sadness and grief about the, uh, over the divorce and, and uh, being exiled from the laboratory and the research, this elite research circle. Um, but there's not a lot about how, uh, how she felt. Um, and I, <laughs> I had to say, I interviewed a number of, of people who were still alive who knew both of them. And uh, some of them told me stories about Esther, but invariably when I talked to them, they wanted to tell me stories about Joshua because he was this brilliant, brilliant man and a man that most people thought was the smartest man they had ever met. So it's a classic example of his brilliance um, overshadowing her contributions and her achievements. Anyone have any questions? I just like to make a comment, you know, after spending most of my working life in colleges and universities, I'd have to say that, you know, sexism and discrimination is really intractable in academic institutions, um, more so than in some others, not to say that there haven't been improvements, but you know, when you higher ed is such a um, an established industry. I mean, it's not innovative in the way tech is, and there isn't there. There's less emphasis in many ways on um, less ability to evaluate people fairly. It seems to me, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, the ways people are evaluated are kind of old timey and somewhat to some extent, a suspect and based on people's opinions and the opinions of people who've known you for a long time and who've been stuck in the same institution you are because most institutions don't have a lot of moving in and out of new individuals. So I, I was just wondering if you'd given any thought to, had she not, had she been in a commercial lab or in a, some other kind of an environment. Uh, did you have any, did you ever conjecture what 
might have happened, might it have been different mm -hmm. than, yeah. than, than when then uh, being in such a staid academic environment where people can be pretty arrogant and stuck on themselves, you know? Yeah, well, I think the the odds were stacked against her. Um, when when they married, uh, they were both very young, but but even though she was only 23 at the time, Esther had already been working for five or six years in the field of microbial genetics. And what she brought to the marriage was a wealth of expertise. She didn't just run his lab uh, for Joshua, but she was able to um, do these experiments. And she made a number of discoveries on her own that um, had she been, well, I don't know, had she been in somebody's lab where they were a mentor and they would have given her um, credit for what she had did, yeah, things might have been different. She might have established an independent career, independent from Joshua. But at the time she was in love and things were going really well. They were pioneers in the, in the field and um, she didn't, she didn't uh, invest herself in her own independent career. It just wasn't, um, she wasn't being uh, strategic about it, I guess. Well, then she probably didn't have a path. I mean, most of these, most of those people who are successful have a path and they have mentors and they have yeah. people encouraging them. And if you don't have that, it's really very different, you know? It and, is. Sorry, it so is. just one, one last thought. I was just through the whole thing. I was thinking, what a shame Joshua wasn't a bigger person that he couldn't have shared. He could, you know, he yeah. might have gotten a Nobel Prize. Yeah. But I guess he did give her credit at the beginning, but then very quickly, he stopped yeah. giving her credit. And then when they got divorced, he refused to talk about uh, Esther. And he, um, I, I talked to a women's studies uh, specialist who tried year after year to get uh, Joshua to uh, uh, interview for a work that she was doing on creative couples. And if any creative couple should, you know, in science should have been uh, in that work, it should have been the Letterbergs, but it was Joshua Letterberg who wouldn't wouldn't cooperate. Um, mm -hmm. And and that's what that's what happens, especially these competitive men. It just becomes this big uh, ego trip, and uh, very um, very. It can be very ugly. You know, I saw it when I was a, a postdoc at Sloan Kettering, um, and I quickly realized that I didn't want to be part of that atmosphere. So I, I left uh, academia and went to, to work for a biotech company. Interesting. Um, Jeff has a question. Jeff, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, let's see if I unmuted this, uh, right? Yep. Kind of a, uh, I assume you, you've looked and did she publish much or did she find similar obstacles to getting published that she did to being accepted in the academic community as a uh, figure, a uh, major figure? No, no, they, um, there's a series of remarkable publications you know, that uh, recorded their discoveries in the early 50s. And Esther's name is on every one of those. Sometimes as the first author, usually, uh, you know, really? one of several authors, yeah. Uh, and some of the people, some of the colleagues in, who knew about what was going on uh, went on on record as saying that Joshua was really lucky to have her as a as a collaborator because uh, um, without her it wouldn't he wouldn't have made the the uh, advances that he did make mm -hmm. thank you um arita you have a question uh, tom did she get an advanced degree or did she go straight from hunter into the lab no she well she went she went from hunter uh she didn't have a um, a mentor or a scholarship to go into, but she worked for a couple of years after that in research labs, sort of building up her credentials. And then she went to Stanford 
as a master's student in 1944. And her, both of her mentors were Beadle and Tatum, right. and the other two men on this uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, there were three of them, Lederberg and Beadle and Tatum. And so she knew all three of them and worked with all three of them. And then after she married Joshua, she was a graduate student, a you know, PhD student at the University of Wisconsin, where they were for 12 years, and she uh, earned her PhD in 1950. I have one question uh, that, that, that was sort of a lead in. Why do you think, or maybe I'm missing something, and I, I don't believe in all this women's lib because of, of Madame Curie, was a very successful scientist. And there are many women who are have excelled either because of husbands, in spite of husbands, because of being alone, whatever. But did she ever, after her divorce, it seems to me you're saying that her work was not recognized even though she made significant contributions and significant uh, revelations in science? Uh, or did she, was she so, was she so uh, upset or disheartened or whatever the word is because of this separation? Well, by, by the time- she were... never, by the time they were separated, they, they both had already um, made these. Uh, it, it had been, uh, you know, 15 years, almost 20 years at that point, and they had already made their uh, important discoveries. And the field was changing quickly. I don't know if you know, but in the but in the 19 late 1960s and early 70s was the beginning of the biotechnology revolution and this interest in creating uh, recombinant uh, organisms, you know, became the fashion. And both Esther and uh, Joshua, what they had done was kind of out of fashion then. Um, but his, but the, the, the glory that Joshua uh, attained by winning the Nobel Prize and he was recognized uh, by everyone as being the brains and that if anything, she was his technician or the hand, his hands in the library, in the laboratory. Um, so the, the prevailing attitudes um, beginning during and after were, were that she was, she was just his wife and like a technician in the laboratory. And but, but did she make any advancements? Did she make any contributions which were not recognized but are recognized today? Even though maybe their work is, as you say, in the late 60s, early 70s, out of fashion. No, no, she's regarded as the mother of bacterial genetics, you know, which sounds kind of obscure, but at the time, uh, scientists didn't know that bacteria had genes, and it was the Lederbergs who discovered that they did. And then all of a sudden, there was this new laboratory rat, the, 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 the popular lab rat, then all of a sudden became the bacteria. And you just have to uh, imagine what was that like? You could do an experiment, you could set it up one day, and the next day come in and get all the results. Whereas, you know, all the other organisms that they had been studying up until then, you had to wait for, for weeks or months before your experiments uh, were finished. And it just uh, afforded this rapid, um, this rapid pace to discovery that, that uh, was incredible. Um, and, then, and then along with that was the virus that Esther discovered, the Lambda virus, which became the model virus for uh, all of molecular biology at the time. So they, together they made these discoveries and it was a team effort, but only the male half of Team Lederberg was rewarded. Uh, whereas in the, in the Nobel Prize, 
the full team of Beadle and Tatum were awarded um, the Nobel Prize for their for their teamwork. Um, yes, you have a question. Is it Frank? Uh, yes, um, Tom. Tom, I've read the book and it's just wonderful, especially for somebody who studied biology. Um, I think in answer to Areta Reed's question and Lorna's, it, um, you you can you sort of tell people about that wonderful example you use in the book about Joshua Letterberg every time she went off so her research working with him took her off and on a new tangent he would close it down and say uh, basically close off that kind of research and say no she needs to just stick to what she and I are doing what wasn't there something like that in well, the yeah, she, uh, was, book? she was a graduate student and like every graduate student the the important urgent goal is to write up that dissertation and while she was doing that in 19 the the late 40s and early 50s she made all of these other discoveries um any one of which you know would have made her famous but she had to finish this stupid um i'm sorry to, to say it that way but but often the the phd thesis is a contrivance that that your advisor has come up with some personal uh, um, question that he's had, and he has the luxury to put a graduate student working it. And uh, I think if if she had been an independent researcher and followed up on the discovery of the F factor or the Lambda virus, um, she would have been, um, you know, she would have established her own independent um career but but she was uh she was his wife and she wasn't gonna um go against his <laughs> his direction or his wishes you also have a, a wonderful uh, example of the difference in their laboratory abilities you talk about a colleague of his talking about what it was like when he was in the lab kind of bowl in a china shop type of thing. Is yeah, that... yeah. I think she was uh, an experimental genius and she noticed things, and this was uh, attributed to her, that she noticed things that other people might not have noticed. Um, and, and that's the way discoveries are made. You have somebody who's really comfortable in the lab and one day something funny happens and they go, hmm, I wonder what's going on here. And then that leads to uh, a discovery. And that happened a couple of times uh, in her research, which uh, Joshua was very uh, kind in uh, uh, pointing out that, uh, that th those discoveries were due to her astute um, observations. Whereas he was not a, uh, a good laboratory man. He didn't have what in the field you call it golden hands. He had the opposite. He uh, he wasn't good, but he was he was really good at taking the data and coming up with explanations or hypotheses or theories. I'm sorry. I'm just remembering. You talked about broken glass in the laboratory at one point. That yeah. wonderful story. That what. Did you say a colleague said something like, if you heard the sound of breaking glass, it was probably Joshua Letterberg sort of? Yeah, that was, that was the wife of his mentor at Columbia. So he was a, a college student at Columbia. He was a phenom. He was uh, allowed to work in the laboratory of Francis Ryan. And Francis Ryan's wife was, you know, like, the secretary or something in the lab and she that was her quote um that she saw him as a young um you know overly enthusiastic uh, uh student who uh <laughs> broke a lot of glassware <laughs> and uh and then he went to medical school and when he was on leave he was on leave from medical school at yale university that's where he made the big breakthrough with his experiment um, it was just extraordinary. And then all of a sudden, 
uh, he had a very rapid uh, rise uh, as a star, a new star in the field. And he, uh, he scored a assistant professorship, professorship at University of Wisconsin at age 22, which uh, you know, was incredible, probably the youngest ever at that point. Any other questions? Um, I just I also, Tom, that I just want you to tell people about uh, what I really got from it. Uh, one thing I really got clearly was that both of them um, were the first to, you know, use bacterial uh, cult to see that there was, um, you know, horizontal genetic transfer as opposed to vertical which you know, was a new term to me, even though I'd studied biology, um, because of their, theirs and others' work, right? Can you sort of explain the difference between bacterial and, and well, you know, so, human? Well, so uh, animals and plants uh, trade, trade genes through this elaborate um, procedure of sexual reproduction. And there's a combining of the genes from the male and from the female, a complete combining. But bacteria are asexual. They just reproduce by one cell dividing in half and the two daughter cells are identical. So for the longest time, bacteriologists didn't think that bacteria had genes. They uh, also, by the way, they don't have a nucleus. So the nucleus which has those chromosomes. Remember chromosomes from high school biology? <laughs> so, so early on, uh, geneticists realized that the chromosomes contain the genes, but bacteria, do, bacteria don't have chromosomes. So what uh, the Lederbergs discovered was this whole peculiar process uh, whereby bacteria can trade genes uh, rather than um, passing them down downward through generations, they can spread the genes like laterally or horizontally to other bacteria, even to other bacterial species. And this is, this is where the, the dread uh, and awful consequences of uh, antibiotic resistance uh, comes in because the bacteria have already developed the resistance genes and they have this really easy way of transferring the genes to uh, other bacteria, to the pathogens, which then become superbugs. I have a question, a couple. Well, one was, did you find any evidence of peer pressure on the part of the other men, in particular, the two men you mentioned that were mentors, were these men putting any pressure on Lederberg not to, to sort of keep his wife kind of out of the limelight. And the second question is having to do with their divorce and whether or not she, she was um, acting on her resentment uh, based on the fact that she had been excluded or do you just think it was just not, a, uh, in the end, it wasn't a fit for them? Is there any evidence of the fact that she, she was chided to, to do that? So. Well, I, I just finished reading uh, The Secret of Life, which is a new account of the discovery of DNA uh, in the 1950s by Watson and Crick. And misogyny is at the heart of that story. Um, it, was just, it was just given, especially in the 1950s. Um, and there was su such little enlightenment. It, it's you know, it's horrible to revisit it like that, but uh, the old boys club was, was uh, there was no way to get into it if you were a woman. And very few women, uh, you know, have won the Nobel prize. Uh, Madame Curie was, uh, is the exception that proves the rule. Uh, she was very exceptional and uh, um, there was another uh, husband and wife team, um, Gertie and Carl Corey, who won the Nobel Prize in the, in the late 1940s, but uh, that one stands out 
again, as sort of exceptional. Um, so there didn't have to be any peer pressure. There would have been, uh, it would have been uh, radical for um, some men to step out and, and uh, give Esther a, a, a fair shake. But uh, yeah, when, when, when she left Stanford after getting her master's in 1946, both, both of her mentors, Beadle and Tatum, were also moving up in their careers and they didn't take her with them. With them. Um, so what was the second question about their divorce? Yeah. I think part of the, the reason they divorced was that despite Joshua uh, uh, claiming at the beginning that he wanted to have um, a scientist, you know, and for them to be co-equal uh, in a laboratory and that they would, that would, they would share uh, domestic responsibilities, but uh, both recognize the supremacy of the scientific goals. He really wanted to have a child. And so he uh, dumped her and uh, married a, um, a young divorcee who already had a little baby and uh, he had, he got an instant family. And it, I know it's it's. it's Is there awful, evidence that, it she, that way. Yeah. Is it was there evidence that she did not want to have a child? Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't able to find that much about that. Um, so I, I I can't say, but I I doubt it. I think that she got into the relationship, you know, with this sort of idealistic. Uh, idea that they would be um, scientists together uh, primarily and husband and wife sort of secondarily, but um, <laughs> it didn't work out. We have a comment um, Anne, uh, uh, and Anne when she's mentioning what we talked about before we began the program, Tom, and you alluded to it a little uh, in the book you just finished but the um, lack of recognition for Rosalind Franklin, who was a key contributor in the discovery of DNA. And she also didn't share the um, Nobel. Yeah. But well, she's she been resuscitated her reputation, right? She's yeah, I think now. gradually she's been uh, given the, the due recognition. The other problem was that she died and the Nobel Prize is not awarded posthumously. So even if there had been a reassessment of her uh, central uh, contribution um, in the discovery of DNA, the fact that she died, you know, meant that she couldn't get the Nobel Prize. But the other guy, I mean, it was Watson and Crick, and there was a third guy, Maurice Wilkins, and he was her boss. And uh, he pretty much won the Nobel Prize because they had to give, they had to put somebody else on there who was involved in the uh, experimental side of it because Watson and Crick, all they did was build a model and they, their model was correct, but they didn't have any experimental evidence to prove their model. And that came from Rosalind Franklin and, uh, and also Maurice Wilkins. So if things improved for women in the lab now, are they getting the recognition that uh... We deserve. I don't know anything really about the um, science world. I think somewhat, um, but there's, uh, you know, academic research is a uh, a hierarchy, yep. and uh, you know there are now there are women in power. I think the uh, a recent Nobel Prize, you know, for genetics was. Uh, Doudna or Doudna for the CRISPR um, the gene editing uh, method and she and her uh, colleague um, you know that's unusual that, that those two women women won the Nobel Prize in chemistry uh, just in uh, 2020 uh, so things are gradually changing but um, you know just like in racial politics um, there's a realization that there's still, you know, a lot of uh, 
bias, mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of bias. Yeah, my my daughter reports reports that uh, from what she tells me, things are a lot better than what you're describing, Tom. But then again, it's been 50 years. Well, yeah, and now in medicine, in medical schools, it's more than 50% of medical school. Yeah. Uh, the uh, problem is she, she views herself primarily as a as an epidemiologist <clears throat> rather than a um, practicing physician, which means that she's on an academic on an academic track. And um, God, the whole publish publish or perish thing and what you can be an editor on, uh, what, what publications you can become an editor of, and uh, when you move and why you move and what people said about you 10 years ago, apparently is still very much, very much there. But I would say contrasted with what, what this, uh, this woman experienced, it's, it, it's, it's a lot better now. Yeah, it is. But uh, I have to, I remember the first time I went out to Palo Alto to Stanford to, to do my first interview. I was reading Frances Conley, I think is her name, her book, which is entitled Walking Out on the Boys. She was the first full professor of neurosurgery at Stanford University and the sexual harassment was so awful that she walked out she quit and, and caused this huge crisis, which eventually changed the whole department. But that was in the 1990s. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And that whole thing was in the 1990s. And I just, when I was reading that book on the plane to Palo Alto, I just kept shaking my head like, you know, here, here it is almost current, current, uh, the current climate. It, it's, it hasn't improved enough. So um, I, I would say that, that it hasn't improved enough and it has, has a lot farther to go, maybe. <laughs> Anne posted another comment that the mRNA vaccine was discovered by a woman. Um, yeah. so I can't remember her name right now, but that she's expected to win the Nobel for her work. So wow. that's exciting. That would be cool, huh? Because we're, all of us here today are the beneficiaries of that. Uh, Absolutely. An amazing vaccine, yeah. I believe the Nobel Committee itself has had a lot of scandals uh, uncovered in the last few years as well with a lot of sexism within the committee itself. And um, so it's, uh, you know, it's everywhere, I guess. Oh yeah. Fortunately, right. Any other questions for, for um, Tom this evening? You have another book in you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think so. And I, um, Joni, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done this if I hadn't been obsessed. Um, I guess I, I knew about obsession. It didn't feel like an obsession while I had it, but I just couldn't let it go. And that kept me going. Uh, and it's a lonely, a lonely process being a writer um, and even 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 today it's a lonely effort to try to promote this you know I'm just still learning how to do that and I'm not I'm not a an expert in the field but um, I guess I'll write another book if I get obsessed with something we'll see <laughs> And everyone should know that that you know Tom. Basically, you went off and you 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 learned how to become a writer, right? You you yeah, yeah. scientific yeah. writing, which was really yeah, I, yeah. During this process, during that this eight years, I I took a graduate course in science writing through Johns Hopkins, and it was uh, an excellent excellent course, helping me to discover the narrative, uh, you know, to being able to to try to tell a story rather than just, uh, you know, describe the science. And so I try to do that in this book. And uh, I think especially at the end where I discovered Esther uh, recreating her life through music, I discovered the, uh, um, the end of the story, which was a, a beautiful ending. 
Well, I, I for one would like to thank you for your eight years of diligent work. I think you've made a significant contribution to the history of uh, science and the history of how academia does and doesn't work well. Thank you, Lorna. That's right. And uh, I will just point out that this book was published by Oxford University Press. So clearly, clearly um, they recognize, the editors recognize the, the quality of the story and the work and the writing. So, um, and that gives me a nice tangent here to thank you, Tom, for for writing this book and for being here tonight. It was your sort of official local area book launch, right? So yes. we were thrilled yes. to have you at the Hotchkiss Library. And we have copies of the book for sale. Um, a few of you have already purchased them. Tom's gonna come by later this week to sign them. So if you're still interested in a copy, um, please call or email me um, in the next couple of days at the library and we can connect you with an autographed first edition. So. That's a, that's a great thing, right? So thank you all so much for uh, joining us and thank you, Tom. And thanks for, um, you know, how wonderful that you, you, you brought uh, Esther out of the shadows. So um, check out our website if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you. And check out our website if you're interested in any of our other upcoming programs. You probably know we're embarking on an exciting renovation and expansion project here in Sharon at the Hotchkiss Library. And we have an ongoing series of Zoom receptions um, where we take you through the plans and tell you what to, what to expect. And you can also come any Saturday in the month of October at 11 o'clock and um, a board member will give you a tour of the library on 10 Upper Main Street and show you the plans and show you um, what's going to happen there. So it's very exciting. And we also you have- You can a join me tomorrow night at eight o'clock, right? For a That's Zoom uh, right. reception on the topic. Yes, if you'd rather do it uh, virtually, Lorna can tell you all about it tomorrow and you can sign up on our website or call us at the library and we'll get you connected. And on Saturday, March, I'm sorry, October 9th, we are co-sponsoring an event with the library in Cornwall. It will actually take place there, but will also be um, shown over Zoom and we'll be hosting Mark Scarborough, who is a very well-known literary scholar who teaches all over this region. Um, and he's written a memoir about the impact of literature on his life. And he's a great writer and a great speaker and he's very funny. Um, and that will be, I believe at six o'clock on October 9th in Cornwall and on Zoom. So there's more information on our website and don't forget to visit us at the American Legion in Sharon and um, hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.